Blog Talk Radio. To our Corona victims, we'll understand it better by and by. Christian Podcast Network, your global transformation station. Good evening and God bless you, everyone. I'm Bishop Shalene Cook, owner, operator, and overseer of the Spirit Alive Network. 
and it brings me, gives me great joy to once again be able to present to you another installation of Professors with Voices with your wonderful host, Dr. Sylvester Henderson. At the top of the program, you heard our very own Dr. Sylvester Carl Henderson with his beautiful and powerful rendition of By and By. And now, without further ado, your host with the most, the Minister of Music, Mr. Gospel himself, my brother and my friend, Dr. Sylvester Carl Henderson. Mr. Cook, I want to thank you for taking the time to once again open this, your doors up, to allow me to bring various scholars onto this program that reaches millions of people all over the world to talk about critical issues in higher education. Everybody knows I love the Lord and I love music. But equally, as much as uh, loving music, I have uh, really developed a great love for higher education, and it troubles me to see how our education system has failed um, many of our people of color and just really failed in general, not from a standpoint of being a physical structure, but really failed from what it really is designed to be. Because you know, Bishop Cook, I talk about this all the time, that my belief is that um, a college or a university is like a faith-based institution minus theology. It's, it takes yeah. away the theological component, so we serve all the elements of the, the institution minus the doctrine. But even from a yeah. human standpoint, caring for all people equally, making opportunities available for all people equally. So th- those are some of the struggles that the system, not just the community college, but the state university, private university, uh, public university, they all struggle with. Uh, I want to introduce our, our, pan- our uh, speaker of panelists to- this evening. We have, first of all, my real dear friend from Santa Rosa uh, College, Dr. George Salou. He is professor of horticulture and one of the only African Americans in the state of California that holds a PhD in plant, I believe, plant animal science. So, Dr. Salou? Dr. Salou? I'm not sure if he is muted. Dr. Salou? Yes, sir. Are you there? We're talking to you. <laughs> I am here. Okay, my phone was, uh, yeah, my phone, I turned on mute to reduce the background noise. Right, and so we, I wanted to have you to say a couple of words about our topic, and um, this afternoon we're looking forward to your involvement, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, tell us a little bit about your position at Santa Rosa Junior College and some of the things that you've done there. So um, over at San Rosa Junior College, um, so I teach in agriculture, which is uh, predominantly in California in particular. Um, it is a – it is someone, a so, Hold on, Dr. Salou. Someone has noise in the back, and we cannot hear clearly. Okay, once again, thank you. Yes, uh, so I teach agriculture, and so um, it is a very different area for, a, for somebody of African descent in the state of California. And so I don't I don't have too many people in that field teaching agriculture in the state of California. Uh, so I run the agriculture business program. Recently, I started a new program called the Industrial Hemp Program, which is the first one in the state of California. Um, and so I've been involved with that, trying to get it and connecting with industry folks to get more people trained and connecting with local farmers. Um, and then now recently with the George Floyd situation, I'm kind of helping uh, with facilitating, working with Byron and other folks on my campus to try to see how we can get administrators to understand how to support uh, students of African descent, faculty and staff, um, you know, those who have felt like that their voice were not heard on campus and how we can make sure that those folks who go look at my campus and uh, we don't see a lot of... Uh, uh, faculty staff uh, who are in position of leadership anywhere, and of course, it's a very small number on campus. So uh, the whole college has, up on, up until last month, I was the only 
uh, black tenured faculty. Uh, so we had two more that got tenured last month. So it's a very strange place for faculty, let alone students. Wow. Well, we're going to come back to you to hear more about how your impact, how your impact has helped to uh, endorse change, not only for your college community, but for the students. Uh, Dr. King, are you available? I'm here, sir. Yeah, Dr. Jonathan King is uh, Vice President of Student Services at Lake Tahoe Community College. And so we've had a chance to talk, and I was just very enthralled with the energy that he actually possesses and all that he does in terms of trying to help pay it forward for not only our men and women of color, not just African Americans, but people in general. We've had many conversations about uh, how the the, the rank of faculty, especially, does not really um, look like our students. So, uh, Dr. King, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'm going to go through a series of questions for all of you as uh, we have hopefully two other guests coming. But I'm once again so thankful for you taking the time to be on this national broadcast. So tell us a little bit about what you do at Lake Tahoe. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I am the Vice President of Student Services at Lake Tahoe. I'm over all of student services, everything from athletics all the way down to admissions and records, international programs, and the like. And my main goal is to help African-American students who are on the fringes. Many of them come. Uh, they want to actually succeed. And when they get here, that feeling is there in the beginning, and then within about three or four months, it's gone. Why did it go so fast? They came to succeed, and then they end up dropping out. I would say almost at most community colleges I've been at, about 85% of those students drop out in the first semester. That is appalling. And for African-American males, it's, it's really horrible because – I would say within a six-year period at most community colleges in California, only 10% of them graduate in six years. That, that's, that's horrible. So when you look at the number that graduate in terms of all students within a six-year period, it's about 40%. But for African-American males, it's 10%. So that means like one out of 10 African-American males that come into a community college, they drop out instantly. Wow. So, so we need to do more. To um, no, what am I saying? No, not not ten, ninety percent drop out when they come into community colleges. So I am trying to turn that around wherever I go, um, and I think the most important thing that we can do is set up learning communities. But I can talk about that later. I just wanted to give you a short okay. Uh, I, I appreciate idea of what I do. that. And we have about six questions. You know what? You started off on a journey of sort of hitting on some of the questions that I have to ask all of you. But uh, for right now, I want to see if. Um, Dr. Uh, Paul Alexander has joined us. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, Dr. Alexander is um, professor, I believe, is it English? Yes, that's correct. Professor of English at San Diego Community College. And so we had a San chance Diego to City meet College. at San, San Diego City College. And we had a chance to meet, and what a wonderful young fellow he is. He has recently been elected as the president of the Academic Senate for the college, and that is the supreme authority of curriculum for the college. So he is the spokesperson for the entire campus, and that is really an auspicious position. So I know uh, Dr. Alexander is very involved in the work of social justice, and um, we've had some brief talks about it. So I'm going to have uh, Dr. Alexander to sort of introduce himself and tell us a little bit of, a little more about yourself. Yeah, so uh, quick correction. So I actually don't have a PhD. I have a, a master's degree. However, I have no problems with people calling me Dr. Alexander. So, in fact, my, 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 my first three initials are PhD, and my last name is Alexander. So, uh, <laughs> I like I, that. <laughs> yeah, so I will. That's I, good. I, will I like take, that. <laughs> oh, I like um, that. But yeah, you know, uh, on a personal level, you know, I'm one of those people who uh, – barely managed to not fall through the many cracks that were out there. Um, you know, took a long time out of after, after off, after barely passing high school, uh, decided to kind of, uh, being poor was not fun. 
um, went back to community college and eventually got uh, my degree in um, comparative literature, had the opportunity to study on a full time scholarship in Syria, um, returned, and as I was applying for uh, PhD programs, um, I was also adjuncting at uh, San Diego City College and a couple of other colleges, which uh, City College is actually what I transferred from, um, and just kind of decided that my passion was actually working with the students. Um, and while I, you know, appreciated academia, I just didn't feel like I was in a position that um, that I could uh, go in that direction. And what I felt would be end up in neglecting kind of the community that I cared so much about. Uh, the I had a, uh, you know, so I adjuncted for a, a long time. That was kind of during that. 10 year kind of dry spell where you know nobody was being hired uh eventually i was offered a full-time position at city college um and yes this last uh year and a half two years ago i was elected as the president-elect of the academic senate uh at san diego city college wow well you know what we're looking forward to your uh participation um before we uh, before we begin our questions and have each of you scholars to answer some of these questions, some of these challenging questions. Uh, I want to see if Professor Byron Reeves is online. Okay, so I'm not sure what happened to him, but in any regard, so we want to thank all three of you for being present. Listen, um, the first question I would like to ask each of you, I would like you to express what has been your largest challenge as an as an African American or a professor of color in the system, in a couple of sentences, tell us what is your largest challenge, and uh, tell us why you feel this has been your largest challenge, and then try to tell us what could have been done differently for the challenge not to exist. So why don't we start with Dr. King? Um. It's a very simple answer. The biggest challenge about working in any college that I have actually been an administrator has been not receiving respect and not being given the resources I need and not being listened to. I know what African-American students and students of color need, but many times the people that are in power, right, who happen to be um, white, right, don't understand what it means to be black. They they don't understand the nuances that go into what African-American students need. And the other thing, too, is we don't have any African-Americans in the classroom. So if we don't have African-Americans in the classroom, those students – are not given a chance to thrive. Now, if they come into the classroom and they do everything they're supposed to do, right, they may may make it. But many of our African-American students are not prepared most times, and they face a lot of emotional, I would say, um, terrorism when they walk in the classroom. They're not given a welcome. And because of that, that's why so many of them drop out. So I don't have any allies at all. I have not had allies along the way. So so if I can recap what you've stated, you feel that your three areas of concern for you before we get to the students, because it's kind of twofold, is lack of respect, not being heard, and not having effective the the proper amount of resources. Yeah. Um, What would, uh, Dr. King, tell us, what would – a supportive college look like to you as a man of color? Express to the the listening audience, what would that look like? Let me give you um, a metaphor. If you hire me to be an expert of student services, let me be an expert. If you (laughs) hire me to drive the damn car, let me drive the car. Don't, Don't try to take over the wheel when I get in the seat. And that's what I find happening to me every time I get into a position of this kind of power. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not allowed to do some things, but I'm not given the level of respect that I see some of the other 
whites getting who are on senior leadership teams. Now, if you don't, if you, if you prevent me from doing my job, when I'm telling you I need resources for, like, let's say, I need resources to set up a learning community for African American students, and you tell me, ah, I don't know, you know, that aren't that many. Why should we put money in there for them? You are now chopping off my legs, and you're chopping off the legs of those students. So the whole thing is treat me like all of the other senior leaders who have the same skin complexion as you. The thing I need most is respect. Listen to me. Let me do my job. I'm an expert at this. I've done this for a number of years. I'm not a newbie. But if I get in the boat and you put me behind the steering wheel and I want to go in a, different, I'll go in a certain direction and you're telling me, no, I don't want to go left. I want to go right. And you don't know anything about the student population I'm handling. I have issues with that. So it's been an uphill battle and fight with me. And let me tell you something. The first time that people have listened to me is from the time that George Floyd got hurt or killed. Now people are saying, oh, I, I, better, I better start listening to you. Oh, oh, you're, oh, I'm beginning to realize, oh, you, what you talk, talked about students who are not clued in, those African-American students. Oh, now I'm beginning to understand a little bit more about race. Oh, black lives matter. Oh, oh I think that's right. Black lives do matter. That did not happen until recently. Wow. It's profoundly sad. It, it happened because of the death of George Floyd. Now people are having the wake-up call. Why did it take so long? Because they didn't understand the, um, the critical nature of the situation. Well, I want to interject there and thank you for sharing. We're going to come back and have you to elaborate that on a point of reform, some ideas for reform. Let's go to Dr. George Salou. Uh, Dr. Salou, share with us some of um, what, was, what was your, has been your largest challenge as a professor of color, uh, not just at Santa Rosa, but in higher education in general. Uh, you know, um, just as Dr. King has mentioned, uh, you know, you get this hostility when you walk into a room, Right. Um, I happen to have a PhD in a very rare area, so I feel like when I walk in the room, uh, I have to always prove myself, right? Uh, as if, you know, he must have gotten this degree through affirmative action, or, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> That's right. Right? <laughs> so I'm always trying to prove myself, and then, so they don't believe me, so when I get all these things done, new things, new programs created, getting funding, getting industry support that they can get, then what they do is they try to sabotage me, right, because it didn't come from them. So every day I have to fight that battle going into work, trying to understand, well, why is it that I have to prove myself? I already got graduate degrees in this field. I'm already published in this field, you know. Um, I've taught at every level in California from K through 12 all the way to UC. Um, but I'm coming to a community college and I have to prove myself. So it's a wow. very, so I just, so I look at that as, and, and you get that not just from your colleagues, but also the students who are white, right? Until, and so, so you got to fight that every day. So you got to, you got to try to establish yourself every single day that, you know, I belong in this space. So just those microaggressions in the workplace, uh, you know, I, I mean, I get administrators listen to me talk in meetings and they go, wow, you're very analytical. I'm going, you know, you want to talk to me about analytical stuff? Have you published a single paper in your life in a peer review journal? We want to question my analysis about how smart I am. And that's how they talk to our students. That's why the students don't feel like they belong in that space. So when, we, when some of it like me tries to speak up for the students, they try to, what they call, gaslight you as if, you know, you're crazy or you're too aggressive, right? And I'm, and I'm very far from being aggressive. I just ask, I ask a lot of critical questions that they can't answer. So then they get very, very defensive. So it's a, it's a hostile workplace uh, a lot of times, and they try to always, any idea that comes from you, they want to steal and use it and make it theirs, or they will reject an idea. So I have decided now to give my ideas to white people to present it, then they all hop on it, and the person will come back and say, well, anyway, judge gave me that idea. <laughs> because wow. if I present it, they will, they, will try to, they will try to sabotage it. It's not a good idea. But if I give it to one of my white allies to present my idea, 
I mean, I do it all the time. Even in meetings, I, you know, I, I strategize with them. I say, you present this in the meeting, you get less blowback. They present it, and when tough questions come at the meeting, they turn to me and say, can you answer, answer the questions? But because their colleague presented it, even though it's my idea, uh, they go with it. If I present it, it will never happen. And um, Wow. So, so you never get to, and now, now all of a sudden, you know, you apply for promotion to become administ- an administrator. They don't want you there because, uh, you know, you're not, uh, for some reason, you, you know, they think you're not qualified, right? They don't want you to move up. But they will bring somebody else who doesn't even have the training in that field to be your, to, to be your administrator. So I'll give you an example. You know, at one point I wanted to be an interim dean. We were looking for a dean nationalist. So my colleague said, hey, you know, you have the expertise. You have industry connections. You consult in the industry. Can you be our dean for one semester so we can actually uh, uh, do a national search for, for dean, right? Well, I have a Ph.D. from Davis. I have a master's from Davis. I've served as the president for California Ag Educators. Uh, you know, so, so you can name it. You know, I've been a fellow at the USDA, everything, right? You know what? I'm not qualified to be an interim dean at my college. So they brought somebody else who doesn't even have the training in that field to be the interim dean. Right? Now when they're having issues after George Floyd, they want to talk, talk to me about, oh, you know, do you want to be a manager? No, I don't want to be a manager right now. You do that job. You know, I've asked you for it before. You didn't want to give it to me. Now because you're in trouble, now you want to tokenize me. That's what they do. They want to put you in a position and they give you no power. Like Dr. King said, they put That's you in right. positions just to check a box, but then they totally paralyze you, and then you become the bad guy because you can't do anything because they put you in a position, but they're paying you to do nothing. God forbid you try to do something for black people, they will sabotage you or come after you. <laughs> so, wow. so, so as a faculty, you're getting that from management, you're getting that from students. You know, in my school, I don't teach a lot of black students anyway. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I'm in a space where it's predominantly very white in agriculture. So you get it from every corner, right? So, so you have to work 200% more than all your colleagues who are always sleeping and doing other things. You know, I'm publishing, I'm going to conferences, I'm creating new programs just to be, just to be at the level where they are and they're not doing anything. <laughs> so, so what I hear you uh, saying before we move to Dr. Alexander and come back is that as uh, Dr. King had talked about, respect resources and not being heard, you're stating that even with um, world-acclaimed training, a Ph.D. from very well-respected public institutions, being in the sciences, you still face the same challenges as though you're not educated, as though you're not uh, skilled at what you do, and that the system is always, the system always kind of looks at um, whatever brilliant ideas you have is, oh, you know what? He woke up. I didn't know that was there. (laughs) And so the system never really totally adopts. And then only when they are in trouble are they willing to engage in the conversation. But then you begin to question whether it's authentic. So I want to hold those ideas. I want to hold those points because I'm going to ask even uh, Dr. Salou to talk about another issue, perhaps in a third-person voice that he went through uh, at another college that was just really appalling and was real painful uh, as the two of us are very close, and I know the situation, but it sort of uh, matches in or melts into this conversation as well. So thank you, Dr. Salou, for sharing. Um, I want to have, make sure that I am sensitive to each of you and allow you because very often, very rarely, do black men get a chance to express their hearts. They don't. And this is one space that I want you to be able to respect your heart and to feel comfortable enough. And so I'm trying to find a way to negotiate that but still being uh, cognizant of the time as well. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander. Share some of the challenges, your main challenge that you've had as a man of color yeah, in, the, you know, in I mean, the academic I think it, academy. Yeah, I think in, in many ways um, I've been lucky in San Diego because uh, my mother who raised me was actually uh, a, a, a faculty member at San Diego City College as well. So when I decided to go back into education, I had someone help me navigate which professors to take and which professors not to take, right? 
Um, and I think that really helped me get to the, the support that I needed and make sure that I'm in the right classes. Once becoming a faculty member, again, uh, City College has a special, um, San Diego City College has a special kind of environment that I've been able to benefit from. But as an adjunct, I was also able to see how shockingly different environments on other campuses could be. Um, so at City College, you know, relatively quickly after I got, in fact, I went through the Sadika program, which is geared towards getting um uh, uh, people of color into the community college system in San Diego. Um, and so before I had a master's, I was actually offered um, first to co-teach a class and then to teach a class on my own in my last semester. Um, and then supported there very quickly, was offered um, regular, uh, a regular, you know, English, English transfer level courses, um, and then was able to teach some black perspective courses um, and be involved in the Umoja program, which is a two-year program um, geared towards increasing transfer rate of African Americans. So at San Diego City College, I had a relative amount of support. Um, on other campuses, it was not the same. I remember, uh, you know, making sure that I, I, I had a class every semester so I could continue to get health care was always a struggle. Um, I recommended they didn't have any black perspective classes. I recommended that uh, they offer a black perspective class and offered to teach it. And I was asked what my credentials were that uh, made me <laughs> acceptable for teaching uh, a, a class from a black perspective. Um, and that class, you know, adjuncts weren't invited to um, the department meetings. And apparently a few of the faculty members decided that, you know, as a black man, I didn't have enough credentials to teach English from a black perspective. Um, so that's a huge contrast with San Diego City College. At that time, you know, the president was white. But now at City College, we have uh, a black president, Dr. Ricky Shabazz, who's been there. I think this is going into his <clears throat> third year. Uh, we have um, Dr. Denise Wisenhunt, who is an uh, African-American vice president. Uh, we have a couple of uh, African-American deans. Um, and now um, I'm the uh, African-American, I'm the black uh, academic senate president. Um, and so while I've been supported up until this point, once I was appointed academic senate, all of a sudden there was this new scrutiny that came about. And apparently precisely because we have so many black people in positions of leadership, there's this uh, always this suspicion that uh, you can't be a true and partial academic Senate representative because you're black and the president is black. Um, and if you're not openly declaring enemies uh, with any of your black colleagues, you're looked at as co-conspirators. Um, and so it's this really interesting um, awkward position where people who, you know, I would assume would be my ally have, you know, seek to undermine some of the things that I'm doing. And I think it's because they have this concern that, you know, how can there be, you know, two black people who don't have, you share some type of hidden agenda, right? Black people don't have an ability to question one another or to challenge each other or to think critically. Um, and so uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you have all this support until you're in a position of authority, until you're in, you know, some type of a leadership position, and then uh, some people, not all, uh, some people uh, will begin to question uh, your ability to, to do that. So it sounds like, Dr. Alexander, that what you've talked about is that uh, one of the benefits, I want to start from the benefits, you started about w w having the benefit of having a mom who was an educator and worked at the college, so she was able to navigate, so that's going to lead us into um, some comments I want to talk about that Dr. Mary Gaston from the University of Pennsylvania has brought up. Um, but it sounds like, in addition to that, uh, you're stating that it was amazing that after, as you began to move up institutionally to gain positions of impact, I don't want to use the word authority, I, I, I <laughs> choose to use the word impact, as yeah, you began to gain positions of impact, then your ethics are challenged. And then you ask right. yourself, well, if a white, you have a white academic sitting president, you don't assume that they don't have any ethics, so why should it be that I can't make uh, ethical decisions because the president is black and I'm black? If you had a white president and a white sitting president, there's no problem. Precisely. It goes along. So that brings yeah. us back to, that brings us kind of back as, a, and we're going to start with you to answer this, and we'll go backwards this time. Um, we're going to ask you, Dr. Alexander, what do you feel from your experiences 
could the system do to help bring reform to our system so that um, we could create systems where there is more real a globalization in terms of care and love for all cultures, uh, not just African Americans, but for all cultures, not just not from the standpoint of just a mission statement. Because in all colleges, we have these flowery, beautiful mission statements that hardly anybody understands or implements right. You know, if right. you look at the mission statement of a police department, they'll say we protect, we are, we protect the community. But yet that same uh, policeman will pull a gun out and shoot a child who is disabled or who has learning disabilities. That same policeman will keep his foot on a person's neck and allow them to breathe for eight minutes. And so even though if you look at all of the documents that say what the policeman will do, it looks real beautiful, same way as a college. You know, we have still within higher education, people of color within all higher education, all people of color, but especially African Americans, we only make up, and this is from uh, from recent data, 6% of the academic academy globally. That's just 6%. And that is a huge improvement. Yeah. Because for years when I started, mega years ago, I won't tell you how long that was ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was probably longer than you are old, Dr. Alexander. <laughs> but when I started years ago, I don't even think we had one percent, not even a half percent. But what, and from your from your own intelligence, tell us what two or three things that the system could do to reform not just your college, but the academy of higher education. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest issue that that you know is, is uh, negatively impacting you know not only higher education but K through twelve education is our inability to make learning relevant to the lives of the students that we're teaching, or to specific, specifically to the lives of African American uh, and, and and Latino students. Um, and so how do we create an environment where, you know, uh, they're, the issues that they're dealing with every day, uh, the issues that impact them and their families and the communities that we are from, how do we create education systems that help reflect that and make the learning itself relevant? Uh, so, for example, agriculture, right? The fact that... Um, that there aren't more African Americans who are going through these agricultural uh, classes is, is frankly is a crisis. If we don't know how to grow our own food, if we don't know, kind of understand the systems of, of, of produce from the farm to the to the grocery store and, and nutrition and all of these issues, so you you remain de- dependent, right? And so, how do we teach those courses in a way? How do we? Um, teach all of our courses, whether it's math, whether it's English, whether it's, you know, history or whatever, in a way that our students, those students that we care about, those students that come from our communities, um, can see a direct benefit to them and and learn a passion for learning. You know, I think about Bell Hooks in her book, Teaching to Transgress, where she talks about uh, going to school in a segregated school um, that was not well-funded, that did not have a lot of uh, uh, support, um, and then moving to an integrated school, a quote-unquote integrated school that had financial assistance, that had all of these things, and how when she made that that move, what she really missed was the education that she was getting in the segregated school because education was being taught to her as a form of resistance, and they felt the power of education. You know, we like to tell people that uh, knowledge is power, but then we get them to memorize formulas and, and, and memorize chapters and memorize events in history without so explaining the Logan power Logan of education and knowledge to them. Could, 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 hold on just a second for me. We have noise in the background. Someone, if you could please mute that noise for us. Okay. This is, a, this is a show that's aired nationally, so we want to respect that, please. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Alexander, continue, please, for me, please. 
Yeah, so again, figuring out ways to contextualize education and making learning relevant to our students, I think, is really the priority. And in order to make teaching relevant for the students, you have to have instructors who actually care about the students that they're teaching. They have to care about the lives of the people who are sitting in their in their classrooms and not only look at them uh, as, you know, as, as people sitting in seats. Wow. So basically, in a nutshell, what I've gotten from what you stated has been um, not only curricular relevance, but faculty of color. We need more faculty of color in the classroom so that the students can see themselves in the instructors. And the the curriculum needs to be reformed. You know, we Absolutely. need to have more but culturally what, what responsive curriculum in a sense. Absolutely. But what I'll add to that is, you know, uh, uh, having faculty of color is not enough. Um, being black is necessary, but it's not enough. You have to not only you have to be black, but, you know, we've gone through the same education system that these young people have gone through. And so a lot of us have been kind of, our thinking has been colonized, for lack of a better word. Uh, and so we approach our students the same way that we were approached because we think that that is the correct way to teach. So, yes, it's necessary mm -hmm. to have faculty of mm -hmm. color, but it's also necessary to have faculty who care about students of color. And the mm -hmm. two of them don't always uh, don't always go along. So basically what you're stating, in addition to expand it, let me restate it, is that you need to have um, professors first who care about individuals and who care about not just students of color, but all the students and who are willing to go the extra mile. It is a benefit when it's these caring instructors also represents the students culturally that they serve because the students can, in addition, gain an additional element of, of instruction by seeing themselves. And then sometimes um, I would like to add to that that um, I want to say that it is important that we have faculty of color, but I want to expand the fact that we need to have faculty who respect ideas from the culture, culture that are not the predominant culture, because yes. it's going to take years for us to get more faculty of color in the system given our arduous manner by which we hire. So I want to hold that thought, Dr. Alexander. You said a lot for us to think about. I want to go now to uh, Dr. Salou, and then we're going to go to Dr. King. Okay, Dr. Salou, tell us two or three things that you feel that would help improve our system of higher education as it needs to be reformed. Well, so the the biggest challenge that I have is, uh, as Dr. King and uh, Dr. Alexander have clearly stated, um, I think that we have not, we're trying to use, you know, 1960s policies for 2020. And that's not going to happen. We're not going to make any change here. We need to be able to go back and revisit our institutional policies. Because all these policies were made uh, through lenses that are not going to, that are not going to actually help us. Because, again, most of our colleagues in the Senate, in our unions, they're all hiding behind these policies that, at best, are going to be mediocre. For they're not going to be drastic enough to address the disproportionate impact that uh, these policies have on African American students. And so, I think that uh, we need to look at that because normally we people get lost in the definition of multiculturalism or, or generally, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, diversity, but Diversity, people end up focusing on equality. There's no equality right now when our students have been underprepared in elementary school, you know, middle school, and high school. If you give those two students the same amount of resources, our students are not going to do well still because they've had this proportionate impact, you know, at their foundational level. So we've got to be intentional about providing them resources that will address the gap that they had coming into our system. And so until we begin to look at our policies with, through those lenses, we are going to have some major problems. And so not only to try to hire one or two uh, African-American faculty, but as Dr. King clearly stated, you have to hire somebody who actually understands 
our history. Because if you bring a faculty in who is saying, who is somebody who was raised in a very affluent family, and their parents were, you know, very well, uh, were well off or middle class, and they start telling our students, well, I, I picked myself up by my bootstrap, and what's your problem? And I think, you know, actually we've come a long ways from the 1950s, and so this country is kind of post-racial. That type of black person should not be teaching black students. Okay? So I think that's what people have done. So people have, uh, a, a white administrator have found uh, black folks that are less threatening to them, that, are le that will question the status quo less. Those are the ones that they've appointed to this position. And those are actually co covertly, as, as, uh, you know, as Ibram Kendi will say, those folks are actually racist because they are helping enforce racist policies. So until we begin to think about, you know, how we define, you know, equity or, you know, addressing that gap for our students and faculty colleagues, I, I think we're going to have a problem because that whole diversity thing or this whole, you know, multicultural thing does not address the impact that we have suffered in terms of not giving the opportunities to actually get to these places. So we've got to make sure we have faculty members who understand how to address that in the classroom, in the curriculum, uh, and just, uh, schools that can actually uh, implement those in their policies, not just the very rosy language, but actually how they operationalize those things to actually reflect those values. But I don't think we have that yet. So if we, if we just talk about trying to like each other and getting along, and the policies have not changed, we'll, we'll have the same result that we've been having for the past 50 years, or the past 400 years. Oh. Okay, that's a good point. So your point is we need to basically reform and change our policies because the policies that we have, even if we get along, don't really address the um, teaching for students of color, and it really doesn't address uh, the relevance that the students need from a standpoint of instruction. Uh, and Correct. so it's more than just having you know, faculty of color. We need to change our policies. And I and that sort of brought something else that I want to ask the three of you, but I want to give the respect and time to our wonderful Dr. Jonathan King to ask him as an administrator, because I noticed uh, that there's a lot of emphasis on faculty. I have a I sort of I sort of uh, agree with everything that's been stated. I want to share my thoughts at the end of hearing everyone else's. So I want to now go to Dr. Jonathan King and ask him to share your ideas in terms of what could the system do to reform the system of higher education. Dr. King? I'm not sure if he's still there or not. Did we lose him? I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can now. Okay. So, so the question you know was, what? Dr. King, what could the system of higher education do to bring reform that could help address some of the topics that were mentioned earlier or the perspectives? Okay. We need to have a quota for the number of people of color that are serving as faculty. No ifs, ands, and about it. There needs to be a certain level of people of color who are serving as faculty members. And if that is not addressed, then that particular institution from a state level or from the federal level would have funds withdrawn from their coffers. Does that make sense? In the same oh, I agree. way, in the same way when, when Mayor Jackson, great politician in Atlanta, began serving as the mayor, he realized that the funding that was going toward vendors who, who were working on the airport, it was almost like 99% white. And he said from now on, at least 25% of the contra subcontractors have to be African American. That changed the landscape overnight. Millionaires popped up overnight because 25% of them had to be either African Americans or females. So in the same way that we know we can bring changes about uh, helping our students of color, everything starts off in the classroom. You have to have those people in there because they are going to bring something that, that you know, white instructors sometimes can't bring. I'm not saying they're not allies you know, at that level, but you have to have people of color. The reason why 
you know, these HBCUs have a higher uh, track record of getting students to the graduate level is because they are getting that emotional support in the classroom. It's, it's not just about the academics, not about the intellect, intellectual piece. It is also like, hey, I'm going to wrap my arms around you. And I'm going to make sure you don't fail no matter what happens. Even if you're from the country, even if you only have a minimal education in high school, I'm going to wrap myself around you and make sure you don't drop, you know, through, through the cracks. That's the first thing. Second thing is money. Talking about money here. Many students drop out because of housing insecurity. They drop out because of food insecurity. They drop out because they don't have the right technology. They don't have money to get from uh, one uh, month to the next. And I've worked for private colleges, and it's a totally different ballgame. The private, for-profit sometimes institutions will make sure that that student, I don't care what color he is, is not going to fall through the cracks. I've been there, and I've seen where they say whatever that person needs, if he needs a gas card, he needs, he needs a, a food card or whatever, he needs to get through because if he fails, we, we take the impact. We're not getting public money like some of the public institutions do. Okay, and then the other thing is that we need more African American uh, folk to step up and and go from being in, in in the lines of being faculty members to coming over on the dark side, working as administrators because administrators matter. I'm telling you right now, a dean can make a very big impact and difference because he's over resources. When you have a person who becomes a vice president, you still have a lot of sway. And when you become a president or a chancellor, even more of that. So I think on those different levels, you're going to have to have money to support those students, meaning like within the foundation, there have to be uh, instructor, more instructors in the classroom. We don't have any African-American instructors at my college. It's a crying shame. It's a crying shame. And when I went and asked them, can we set up an Umoja uh, learning community, the answer was no. Then the answer was no. I see what a lot of these students make it to the end. Wow. Well, you know they what? Carry the um, load. Dr. King, let me see if I can um, answer uh, some of the questions. Um, you talked about um, uh, faculty members uh, considering going, leaving the uh, position of being a professor to go, becoming an administrator because of the impact they can have system wide or over particular clusters within the college that can help make um, value and change. Uh, you also talked about the fact that a college, uh, if it really wants to make reform, has to have an infrastructure that can help offer services to students, such as food, housing. And whatever the student need not to allow the student to fail, if they don't have Internet, if they need computers, whatever needs to happen to make it so that in a sense that the, the institution becomes a place of social humanity where people can come to get what they need while they're trying to start at grade one and move on to grade ten, hypothetically. And we have to find a way to value uh, the individual's. Um, Dr. Alexander talked about the fact that we need the faculty members to care. We do need faculty of color, but we need them to care because just having faculty members of color, but they're not willing to care and go the extra mile to adapt their curriculum, that's not helping as well. Dr. Salute talked about the fact that we need more policies we need more legislative policies, campus policy, district policies that uh, will enforce uh, whenever we come to areas that are challenges that will force us to understand, look, we have to change. We can't have, we can't get along but still use the same policies that sort of guided the academy, the academic academy, 100 years ago. We need to change in order to make everything relevant. Now, I want to ask a question, but before I ask this final question, before we let our listening audience come in, I want to bring up two uh, areas that I see slightly differently. <laughs> and I want to hear the difference. Okay, uh, 
I do believe that becoming an administrator, I'm going to start from that standpoint, is a wonderful profession. The challenge that I have is that to become a professor is nothing less than equal to that of being an administrator. And in the California Community College structure, the value by which people sometimes may not be able to demonstrate the level of care is because they're given a bait and switch. You have a very smart professor that comes in, and they hook up with an administrator that says, we're looking at you. So that basically means you can't go against the grain because you're trying to become selfish and think about yourself. So the, the point is, where is the value for becoming a faculty member and understanding that that is complete within itself? Doesn't mean that I don't respect the life of the administrator. Doesn't mean that the administrator is not equally as important as the faculty member. But where is the value? You never hear anyone talk about raising the value of the professoriate. In the UC system, the professors are the ones who are supreme in the system. In the community college, it's completely different. We have a bait and switch. And so then what happens when faculty members do want to go against the grain, if they think, oh, my God, I want to be a dean, I can't speak up against what is right or wrong because the manager who may be white may look at me as being a rebel, and I don't want to make him or her mad. So from that standpoint, I believe that the system needs to equalize its positions. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about in terms of value and position within the academy. I look at everyone as having an equal state in terms of how they are to educate the child. Remember the African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. So if it takes a village to raise a child, it's not like the mini professor has one value and the super administrator has another. Everyone is equalized. They have deep, different, uh, I would say, penmanship authority. And I think the penmanship authority is where we look at now as opposed to looking at the overall equalization of the value. That's my perspective. Secondly, I want to address the fact of what uh, Dr. Salute talked about, the reformation of policies. I think that is it, is, I want to ask the question, is it policies that we need to change or is it simply action and being not, not going against the grain what we need to change? Now, I don't have any of the answers for any of these. I have my own perspectives. But um, to me, I feel that even if we create more policies, and even if we have flowery statements that say we're going to do this, we change in the system. I can talk about my district. My district, uh, that, which is the Contra Costa Community College District, they've changed in many of their policies. Oh, if you look at our employment policy, they look great. But if you look at the actuality of who we hire, it's pretty much the same. We've made small increments amount of improvement, and I find that systems will make a lot of improvement quickly when they are forced with public scandal. But once that scandal is gone, the truth of who the system is comes back into play. So my question is, what can we do going forward to be more caring, as Dr. Alexander says, to put our policies into action to understand that as you move into administration, that you are not better than the professor. You've just extended your classroom. Since the, the basis of the institution is the classroom. Now, I'm going to let, who wants to go first? Because that's a lot of information in there. <laughs> uh, I just wanted, I wanted to say one thing. This is John. I just wanted to say one thing about uh, um, a not a policy, but uh, a different reform that I think can really lead to success. Because the bottom line for me is how many students are actually graduating in two to four years. It, you know, we can have all of these things change in terms, like you said, we can change the um, the mission statement. You know, we can change the the, num the number of people that are working as faculty members. But in the end, if we don't see a change in how many are successful, 
that means a lot. So one thing that I think would make a difference, and this would be expensive, would be to ensure that every African-American student has a mentor who is going to walk with them all the way to the very end. In the same way, Umoja has the learning communities, and also Fuente have learning communities where every single person has a mentor, it really increases the level of success that those students will experience in a two- to four-year period. That's okay, that's sense. a good point. Dr. Salud, you had some comments you wanted to make, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Alexander. Yeah, so um, I think that, that that's a great point, and I think that's why we've talked about, you know, guided pathways, that are competent and and they understand the cultural values that this that our students bring to the classroom. So if we don't have those, you know, for our students, then because so that mentorship will be built within those classes. Um, and the other problem is we have very few uh, African American faculty across in, across the system. And we try to overwork them, overwhelm them, put them on all the committees, so then they then they cannot deliver on everything accordingly. So then they get burnt out and they leave, or they just stop doing anything. So if we bring them in and we bring enough in, we have enough people to go around to be mentors, to support all the students. Then we can actually, you know, drill down to make sure that uh, the students get mentorship, the students supported put it in the learning, you know, pathways, then I think we are better off. And so I think that the whole hiring thing that I mentioned earlier on, I think the policies about hiring, we can have, the problem is we're changing policy, but we're having white people write the policies for us. That's the problem. Right Absolutely. now, we're talking about, they are trying to change policy, but who's writing the policy? It's not us. So we have to be able to write those policies. We've got to write the policy. You know, they're going to write it without the context of black bodies. So it's not going to really address the issues I want to address. So uh, we got to make sure that we are the ones who are involved and they have to compensate us for that time or get people from our, from that understand, you know, our cultural background and all the things that we're talking about to write those policies. Until we do that, I think, and also just we have to have people across there. We have to have counselors who also who understand our students. And all of those things have to be in place. We just can't have faculty. We also have to have the allies, faculty, that also understand our students and all from, the, all from similar backgrounds. And, and Dr. Salou, how can this happen? How can this happen when in our system money seems to be what people run after? People run after well, money. They don't run after ethics and work. They run after big, fat well, paychecks. And when you run after big fat paychecks, what happens sometimes is you're willing to compromise, even though you know something is wrong. Everybody runs well, after money. Well, what we just mentioned by Dr. King is very simple. If the money that we get are tied to completion, if you don't, if the students don't graduate, you don't get the money, then they will wake up. You have to tie that to accountability. You have to tie that to money. So. If That's there right. is a disproportionate loss of income for not graduating black students, college will get serious about it, right? Okay. But, but, That's right. But there's no impact right now. So let's say if it's a point, if you have a multiply of three for graduating each African American student compared to the students who are not, not impacted as much, I think colleges will begin to get serious about it. But right now, there's no, you know, if a student. I like that. Thank you. You know what? Thank you, Dr. Salo. We're going to come back. You made some good points as well. Each of you are making some good points. You know what? Now, I appreciate and love all of you. Okay, um, Dr. Alexander, share your thoughts. Uh, could you repeat the question just really quick because I want to make sure that uh, I'm getting exactly to the point that, that you want? Uh, well, basically, knowing that we have all of these barriers in addition mm -hmm. to social reform, where do we go from here? What do you feel that we can do? Because I asked a question as well. Um, if we just change policies, it was brought up, right. and I gave and I shared my perspective about you know policies are simply written down. What happened to That's action? Right. You know, and then I mm -hmm. also talked about the fact that we have a lot of bait and switch in our system, where people yeah. are not willing 
to compromise. People are willing to compromise their ethics because they're thinking, oh, my God, I become a professor in 1920. I don't want to be a professor in 1935. I want to be president. And I brought the idea to Dr. King. They say, wait, 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 wait. What happened to, what happened to raising the value of the professoriate? Because my belief okay. is that the professoriate is complete as being a college professor, I mean, being a college administrator. To me, the only difference is penmanship authority. Right. That's how I look at but, it. I look at it firmly. I don't look at myself as any less than any other person. And I've lived my whole life as a college professor for this system, the UC Berkeley system, for 20 years, the state university system for 13 years. And I've been in the community college system 28 years. So I have been around. And I look at all the systems as saying, I specifically chose to remain as a faculty professional because I feel that is where the heart of who I am, but it's also the heart of what I believe who makes the most impact. That doesn't mean that I take away the value of what administrators do, but no administrator can talk to me and make me feel like I have less value in the academic academy because I'm a faculty member. Absolutely not. And so I'm yeah, asking, I mean, what are your so, thoughts on those yeah. questions? Yeah, I mean, so I think, first of all, um, what, what, what you're talking about in terms of faculty is, you know, the same thing that we talk about when we talk about black pride or black power, right? We have to be able That's to right. view ourselves as faculty members first, um, that, that our voice is equally and sometimes more important. As you said, these institutions would not exist if it were not for faculty. Um, and so that's one piece of it. The, the other piece is like, so, you know, how do you challenge these large institutions that, you know, that kind of, and these bureaucracies that kind of run on their own, and that when you do get faculty members or when you do get administrators who are like-minded, that they end up themselves becoming more, or you do get good policies, they themselves end up getting transformed by these large institutions that they're a part of, and as a result, don't become kind of actionable uh, uh, items that actually change um, the situations that, that we're talking about. Um, and so I think that in the same way it's necessary to have faculty, I strongly believe that maybe 95% of people in education are in education because they actually care about the students. I believe that Absolutely. they're in education because they actually care about education. Uh, the problem is, though, and that's the same with faculty, the problem is, though, is where do they put the value of their own experience and where do they put the value of their students? As an administrator, where do they put the value of their own experience as an administrator and where do they put value of the faculty that are there? If you have, in the same way that if you have a faculty member, if you have an instructor who does not value the individuals that are in his classroom, it's going to be very difficult for them to impact them and give them any true education. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to give them the type of knowledge that is empowering. You may be able to get them to memorize and regurgitate, but you're not going to be able to actually create uh, thinking, critical thinking human beings that can then move on to change the world. In the same way, administrators, if administrators don't respect, if administrators don't appreciate and value the faculty members, uh, and the staff members that are on their campuses, then likewise, it's going to be very difficult to create institutions that then help transform individuals. So, you know, some of our best, the, the best instructors, some of the best instructors, the best people in the classroom, if you mention to them you should go into administration, they'll look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Because the experience that they've had with administration is an experience that rejects their their uh, human, um, it, it rejects their humanity, and I don't mean that in a in, in a uh, kind of a racial um, humanistic sense. I mean in the sense that they're just an individual that fills up a classroom, and that their opinion and that their ideas and their expertise aren't valued unless there's a box that checking it will enable them to value. So a lot of uh, the, you know, my colleagues on this call have talked about, you know, after George Floyd and the uprising, all of a sudden they're valued in being asked to speak and being asked to be on committees and everything like that because there's boxes that now need to be checked. But those boxes being checked and that type of uh, surface-level respect 
um, it is not the type of respect that's actually going to create change. So we have to encourage administrators. We have to encourage student services to have the same approach that we value as instructors. Uh, they have to have that same approach with, with everybody on a human level. Because really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a human issue. We have a human Racism in this country has been taught to us. We've born, been born and we've been raised on it. It's bred into us from, you know, a very early age. Uh, and so we really have to address kind of our issue as human beings, and our relationship with one another, and how what role does race play in those those relationships, and how do we really change and begin to imagine different ways of working with people? You know, I'm a I'm a I'm a uh, a, a pessimist. I'm I, I'm an optimistic pessimist. Uh, And I've seen administrators. I think Dr. Shabazz is a good example of somebody who actually seeks out faculty members' advice, uh, who actually seeks out the academic senate's uh, opinions, um, and actually listens, who seeks out students' uh, uh, advice and actually listens, right, and actually will act upon those things. And so we all have to really kind of remind ourselves, hey, we are all in this together. Everybody is doing this for the one, the, the, the right reasons. And so now how can we change the way that we look at one another uh, in order to change these systems that if you look at any of the statistics across the board, say, yell out and scream, whether it's in, in, in black faculty members, whether it's the success and transfer rate of black students, uh, whether it's in any of those statistics, we are failing and it's criminal. And so what can we do in order to make sure that the policies and the lip service that we we see being written down uh, and the committees that are created, what can we do to really make sure that these um, become not just another meeting, not just another conversation, not just another box that's being checked or outside experts that are being brought in to teach our faculty members how not to be racist, but how can we actually uh, change our minds? How can we change our hearts uh, and, and really you know, reform a system that is, uh, you know, broken at best, intentionally structured to disenfranchise our students at worst. Well, you know what, Dr. Alexander, I, I really feel that the, the point of care that you've talked about, because as our other two panelists, when you speak, I can actually feel your humanity and I can really feel the love and care that you have for people. So I want to thank you for such a wonderful analysis uh, and the sharing of your perspectives. As we are, I'm going to ask at this point, uh, because we only have about 10 to 15 minutes left, the time went by so fast. Uh, this is something that we could talk about a long time. So I want to thank all of you for coming on. Uh, first of all, documenting, we're going to have our Bishop Cook at this time to come and see if there's anyone in the chat room who would like to ask a question. Very often people are afraid uh, to ask questions. Some will, some will not. So I want to give her that opportunity. And then I have, we're going to sort of come up with some wrap-up questions. Um, and as uh, Bishop Cook. Yes, can sir. I, can I just really quick jump yes, in? Can yes, I jump in really yes. Quick? And I apologize. I apologize. Uh, I have another event that I'm running, and so I'm going to have to jump off a little bit early, so I may not to be may not be able to be present uh, for the the last question session. And so I apologize ahead of time, uh, and feel really bad because honestly, I'm honored to have been invited um, to be with such amazing colleagues and to have yourself, you know, uh, uh, leading this conversation. And so thank you so much. And again, I apologize if I end up having to jump. No off problem. You know what? Uh, care is not demonstrated in a macro level; is demonstrated in a micro level. And Amen. so, whether it's macro or micro, we appreciate whatever time you were able to give us. God bless you. Amen. And thank you, one right on you too. Amen. Okay, Bishop Cook. We oh, want to see if there's anyone in the listening audience. Yes, that sir. Has yes, a question. sir. Amen. If you have a comment or question for uh, these, oh, wow, these wonderful instructors, these wonderful caring men, um, you may press your one at this time, and I will address you by your area code and the last four digits of your phone number. If anybody in our chat room has a comment or question, please type it now, and I will relay it to uh, Dr. Henderson. we still have Dr. Alexander, and we still have Dr. King. Amen. So I'm looking. So at this point, a sister is scrolling, 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 scrolling. 
Mm-hmm. All right. I don't see anyone, so gentlemen, please proceed. We'll continue then, and just let us know if there is. Okay, so uh, yeah, let me ask the two of you, where do we go from here? I mean, where do we go from here? Because I believe that the reform is so enormous that it is not uh, um, collegiality that's going to make the change. It is aggressive resistance against the system that will endorse Amen. and force change. Yep. I just believe that because when you when you talk about trying to go from faculty to management, sometimes that sort of compromises your ethics. When you talk about managers who are in a position, sometimes they feel afraid where I can't really come out strongly because they have a family to take care of, and I get it. I can't really be the person who really pushed for diversity and equality because, you know what, I don't want to lose my job because I can't, I'm not the president, so I can't speak. You may have a president that uh, sort of prohibits you from speaking in, in public on issues that are right versus wrong. You may be in the, you may be a dean or a VP working with a president who really don't care about diversity so much, who really doesn't care about equality. Or you may be as uh, Dr. Salou is in a situation where you know what you you're not heard un- or you're not really contacted until there is a co- there is a college-wide pandemic. And so you need to be able to look as though you care. But in reality, you really don't care. So, I mean, where do we go from here, gentlemen? I, 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 I'm I going to jump in. Let me jump in real quick because <laughs> that's a great question. Absolutely, we have to be radical. And I believe that teachers really in those positions that you described are probably the specifically tenured professors they have to be the ones that are radical and pushing for that type of radical change, unapologetic, radical change, holding themselves, uh, uh, holding everybody accountable because, because of uh, the security that we have in our positions, because of academic freedom, that's a voice that we cannot afford to, to muffle. Um, and so in addition to pushing for collegiality, that can't be enough because collegiality at the expense of humanity of our students, at the expense of the humanity of our faculty, at the expense of the humanity of, of our professional staff, is not collegiality, it's depression. And so we have to be absolutely unapologetic in pushing to change the systems that have uh, been criminalizing and been failing us for such a long time. I agree, Dr. Alexander, because, you know, with faculty, tenure faculty are protected if they're willing to exercise it. I have, yep. In my district, I have been a force that have been constant in terms of talking about change. You know what? Some people like it, some they don't. But this is what mm-hmm. I always say. I always say, whether you like me or not, I'm going to treat you with respect, but I'm going to still speak the truth. I don't really care whether an administrator likes me or not. That's not that's, that's right. not the goal. I'm not there to teach for the administrator. I'm there to work for the students. So it doesn't matter to me whether they – and so sometimes what happens is I, you get blocked from jobs. I'm okay with that because I say, look, you know what, Rome was not built on one address. Whatever passion you have you want to demonstrate it, you can demonstrate it beyond that address. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. So I think absolutely. that all these small childish games the system play lock you out of a job, don't let you advance. You know what? Don't give you assignments. Try to try to block you. All that stuff is foolish. At the end of the day, when people are wrong, tell them that they're wrong, and stand up for it, even if you're the only person doing it. Call a thing a now, thing. Amen. Go ahead. That's right. Call a thing a thing. <laughs> Uh, Dr. King? I want to give an amen to that. I think amen. all of the tenured, all of the tenured African-American faculty that have that power should really take advantage of it. The only downside of that is in California, you're, you're going to be in the forest kind of by yourself. So I think the next step has to be getting more people of color into that point of being tenured. Because if you, have a, if you have one tenured or two tenured faculty members and the rest are all adjuncts who don't have any power, you really can't go far. The other thing, too, is all of the brilliant professors like you, doctor, should stay in the classroom, should be 
faculty forever because you are the game changers. When I, when I reflect back on being in college, those four or five years, the people that come to the forefront of my mind are not the administrators. They are the faculty members. They're the ones who inspired me. They're the ones who made me want to rise up and go on out and, and conquer the world. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. But when it comes to the, um, the people that are the managers, the people that are, you know, working in, in, in administration, one thing that's holding them back is that they can't speak their mind most times. When they are outnumbered and they sometimes have to discipline some of the people that are not working with our students, when you discipline one of them, they all rise up against you. So, so, so the thing that I, I would love to see would be for us to become tenured, you know, like let, let us be in for four years and be tenured for five years. If I could be tenured for five years, I could speak my mind. But if I'm not tenured, I have to think about this person is here to undermine me. I'm one step away from being pushed out because the vote of no confidence is real. The vote of no confidence is real. And if you're the only African-American administrator, and I mean, I remember one time I had to discipline a white woman because she knew that this person who was suicidal could hurt themselves. And when that person left the classroom to kill himself, she did not alert me as a dean. That person was out there ready to kill himself. They had helicopters looking for him, but she didn't tell me for like four or five hours. That man could have killed himself. When I brought her into my uh, office and said, why didn't you tell me that this man was suicidal? We needed to take care of him right away. You know what she did? She went to some of the other white male faculty members, and then they started charging against me. Because Mm. to me, to them, I had threatened her. Threatened her for asking her why didn't she do her job. So my whole thing is, had I been tenured, that wouldn't have happened. I would have said, you know what, I, would, I, I should have written her up and I should have fired her because that man could have killed himself because you didn't care for him because he was a minority uh, student. So I think Absolutely. it has to go both ways. It has to go, you know, African-American administrators are always on their P's and Q's and they're always walking on eggshells because they have no protection. And if you don't have... Mm. Uh, African-American faculty members who are tenured, who can, who can come up there and support you, it, it's a done deal. Does that make sense? What I'm, the yeah, kind it of does. Scenario and you know I'm what? About, uh, we're going to have be- to come back at a time, Dr. King, because I'm going to have a uh, – we're going to have to put together perhaps maybe you and I'll get my friend – uh, Dr. Ed and Dr. Byron to come back and talk about just the challenges of helping change the academy from just the lens of administration. Because I yeah. think that you have a message uh, that really is profound, is that how do you speak your truth when you are in a system where, uh, I mean, okay. the reality is that you're working, but you only have a certain amount what you can do. You have no power. It can end overnight, I'm telling you right now, because – of the fewness of our numbers. You know what I'm talking about. You're on a one year contract, a two year at the most. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get the support of your faculty members on the academic side, you are toast. You're always putting on that nice, happy face. You have to as an African American, because as soon as they realize, Oh, there's some rage in that man, or he's not down with our agenda, you're gone. But I can tell you what, I think there's so much freedom in being tenured. I would love to have that, that, uh, Ability to become tenured. Well, I could really. Well, let me speak let you know. Mind. I'm gonna send you a couple of applications. <laughs> we gonna work on that. <laughs> no, I don't have the brilliance you have, Professor. I'm saying all these brilliant professors like yourself stay in the classroom, stay in that world because that's that's going to help our students succeed. Really, that's honestly. what I plan that, to that, do. Let's hear from yes. Dr. Salou because I know we're coming. Uh, this uh, is such he, a passionate topic. He, he had to leave us. I'm so sorry. Dr. Salou had to leave? Yes. Did he Did he have to check off with Dr. Alexander? Yes. Okay. Well, we're coming. Do we have a question or so in the chat? No, sir. I'm sorry. We don't. Um, okay. You know, we're, ju- we're just all sitting here. I want to thank everyone, all of you, um, and, and especially you, Dr. Henderson, for this topic because, you know, it, it lets us on the outside of the academic world see inside for a moment. And a lot of this, these things that you talk about, 
we're not aware of, not as a not as a faith based community, not as uh African American community. And these are things that we need to know so that we can do our best to help you help our children. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, I, as you know, um, Bishop Cook, absolutely, I am uh, the professor of all professors. <laughs> I say that. Mm-hmm. I have been in the teaching academy of higher education. I have taught the equivalent of 150 years' worth of courses. Mm-hmm. My all Lord, of my teaching yes, sir. It's been over 150 mm-hmm. years. And, and mm-hmm. this is the point about it. I still love teaching. Amen. I, that's right. I, I walk the title of being a professor. To me, that's like that's like one of the highest titles in the world. I value Amen. everyone's position in the academy, but when I took the job, I didn't take the job because of money. I didn't take the job because, oh, I had to make a whole lot of money. I figured out that that's why I've always worked multiple jobs. I took the job because I wanted to make a difference. Now, as a result, after working in one college for close to 30 years, I make a decent salary. But I worked equally as hard when I didn't make a lot of money. When I started, when yeah. I was started, I made like 38000 a year. And I worked just as well as I, as I do now 40 years later. 50 years later. Amen. I mean, when you think about the amount of energy that God has allowed me to put in the classroom, holistically, it has been, it's amazing. Because, like, you know, 30 years almost one place, 20 years another place, 13 years another place, the equivalent of 150, you know, years of teaching. And I, nothing to me is better than teaching. I am very excited when I hear students and see students learn and see students grow because, to me, that's the impact that you make. But I'm also very honored and I'm very excited about having uh, met fine uh, administrators such as Dr. Jonathan King. When we met, Amen. when I met Dr. King sometime bef- uh, a couple of months back, you know, there was something that was very, I think, passionate to me about him. And it wasn't just what he said, but it was his heart. You know, I, as a performing art man who's dealt with millions of people, I can sense when people are, are really true and honest. And I want Dr. Mm-hmm. King to know that I deeply love him and I appreciate his honesty. And I appreciate him as a professional. And I am going to pray that with, wherever he's at, that um, he is able to uh, at some point, exercise all the brilliance because, Charlene, if you hear uh, all that this man has done in terms of educating himself for the academy, it's simply amazing. So if no one Amen. else, if, if no one acknowledges you, Dr. King, the way they should, I want to publicly on this broadcast acknowledge you myself. I'm, I'm, so, honored. You. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And Amen. I want to build a so. college for you. Professor Henderson, I want you to be the president and also teach all those great classes and teach us all how to play piano. Well, you I, know, I, you, I'm I really, glad you, you said know, that, Because, because key, let me tell you something. We're begging for crumbs. I have been we need to have our own I'm colleges. To be doing we need to have our own colleges in California. I don't understand why we don't have a, a black college out here. I really don't. Well, you know, we need one. We, we need, need to have need one. Why are we begging, begging these people to help us? When we got all of this capital in California, well, it makes no sense. All these amen. millionaires, billionaires in California, we can't, we can't even start one college. And I'm telling you that people like you that could run a college and you could do it well. Do you know why? Because you're brilliant. You have a passion. You've been in this game a long time. And I'm telling you, you could run circles around a lot of the presidents I worked under. I'm sorry. I know well, you could. Oh, that well, you know what? Hallelujah. I believe I can, but you know, for right now, I'm gonna tell people all the time. I always say this: my college. I am the. I am a president of my classroom. Yes. There you go. Amen. And my and classroom on that is note. my yes. institution. Yes. <laughs> and Amen. Me, I'm the president of my Hi. classroom. Listen, Dr. King. Thank you so much, Dr. Salou. Um, 
obviously had to drop off about a couple of minutes early. I'm sure it was three or four minutes earlier. And Dr. Alexander let us know earlier that he had some other obligations. I am coming right to the time. Uh, Bishop Cook, this is such an emotional conversation for me. Uh, before we turn you over to Bishop Cook, I want to thank all of you for your support musically. Uh, I am asking that those of you who hear many of my videos, please subscribe to the YouTube page. I am doing a social justice tour that's going to take me all over the world, playing Amen. and showing how hymns, hymns are music without words, but we're going to talk about the history of the hymns in terms of how they can impact the lives of people of color through the education system, from using the words and the, and the melodies from the hymns. And so we're going to talk about how those melodies themselves will actually infiltrate and create a sort of a psychological experience and how that psychological experience can lead us to the point of not only emotional uh, reform, but it can lead us to social and intellectual reform and really come into grips with the fact that all humanity is equal. We all are Amen. equal in God's presence. Thank you. So having said you. that, I want to thank once again you, Dr. King. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Selou. I want to thank Dr. Alexander for all of your participation in this very passionate topic. And then finally, I want to give a great congratulations to um, Bishop Cook. She, her husband, uh. passed and went on home to glory, but today would have been their 26-year wedding anniversary. Wow. <laughs> and he was a wonderful man, Mr. Monty. He was a wonderful yeah. man, Mr. Monty Cook. So I want you to know, Bishop Cook, that you know I love you more, even though now she done went to, I think it's St. Louis. You know, even though she's now in St. Louis, I want her to know that if she simply turns on the camera, whenever she sees me playing, know that every note is how much I love you as a person. Wow. That's cool. Oh, and, that is beautiful. And I appreciate you so much. Your and network I, I has appreciate blessed you millions more. of people, and thank you, and God bless you. God bless you. This has been the wonderful Dr. Sylvester Henderson and all his fine colleagues for Professors with Voices, and we're going to leave you with a little something from to Henderson. Amen. Good night, and God bless you. Inspiration Gospel Choir from the University of California at Berkeley, an ensemble of cultural diversity with college students, we have acquired a sensitivity for self-appreciation. We believe, as the late Dr. Martin Luther King did, that each individual life is an expression of divine worth and dignity, which can only have meaning in terms of its relationship with others and communities of all races and cultures. The Young Inspiration Gospel Choir strives to express the moving energy that makes the gospel expression of the gospel in song and art form. This energy displayed through gospel music was first brought to life among enslaved African Americans who gleaned from it the strength and assurance that someday they will live and work in freedom. As a song of freedom, the successful performance of gospel music requires that the vocalist sings with a selflessness and an unabashed discipline and strength that becomes the spirit of the gospel song. It is this essence that distinguishes the gospel music among any other American musical art form. So on behalf of the Young Inspiration Gospel Choir, our director, Sylvester Carl Henderson, we would like to thank you for combining your intellect and your thoughts with ours for this gospel concert, which radiates peace, joy, strength, and most of all, dignity. Thank you.
and from my household to yours, be ye transformed. Good night, and God bless you. God bless you. And thank you again.